Coming up on Tech News Today, the Wii gets smaller, Google Play gets less anonymous, at least for reviews, and the bitter struggle for the internet gets more and more bitter. A lot more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 27th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio, plus more than 50 new features including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT11. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world and put them in context for you. Starting each day with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Play. A very black and dark... This is a new one. Oh, there we go. Ah. <laughs> Nintendo will launch the Wii Mini December 7th in Canada for $99. The smaller version of the original Wii comes in red with a red Wiimote and nunchuck. It also does not come with GameCube compatibility or internet access. So no Netflix on the Wii Mini. Still, Canada gets something first. It's the little things. Want to leave a review in the Google Play Store? Well, go right ahead. Just use your Google Plus name and picture. Don't have a Google Plus account? Well, that's fine too. You just can't leave a review. This, of course, means the upside is that users can no longer post negative or fake reviews without linking their personal profiles to that written contribution. So say goodbye to anonymity and say hello to the reality of yourself. It's time for early calendar. Bring... Friday, November 30th, you can get your hot little hands on this the new super thin Apple iMac, but it's only the 21.5-inch model. The larger 27-inch model will start shipping in December. That's great. What about iTunes? No news on the new iTunes. Cyber Monday certainly has come into its own, according to IBM's analysis of transactions from 500 U.S. retailers. Internet sales jumped 30.3% over last year, making it the biggest online shopping day ever. The huge sales also showed a 36% increase over last year's Black Friday sales. We mentioned yesterday Facebook plans to end user voting on its privacy policy and allow info sharing across services. The company is also planning to axe a setting for users to control who can contact them on its email system. And people are not happy. In a letter to Mark Zuckerberg, the Electronic Privacy Information Center and the Center for Digital Democracy said that the changes could be a violation of a deal uh, Facebook made with the FTC back in April over claims that it had deceived users into sharing more info than they had intended. Facebook is supposedly in talks with regulators about these changes. Let's check in with the battle of the smartphones. New data from Cantor World Panel says the Apple iPhone 5 accounted for 48.1% of U.S. smartphone sales. Android dipped to 46.7% of sales in the same period. It's not all rosy for Apple, though. In Europe, Android took 73.9% percent of sales in Germany and 81.7 percent of sales in Spain. Samsung seems to be making a name for itself as a problem patent child. Ericsson has filed a lawsuit against Samsung in the United States accusing Samsung of refusing to sign a Friendly Act, the fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory licensing agreements after two years of negotiations. Erickson filed the case in the patent-friendly district's court of the Eastern District of Texas. Don't know if they're also friendly, though. Oh, I was hoping you'd do that. Uh. You did. <laughs> Mozilla has announced the release of Firefox 18 beta for Windows, Mac, and Linux with significant JavaScript improvements via a new compiler called Ion Monkey which is kind of a great name, but the company promises the performance bump should be noticeable whenever, whenever Firefox is displaying web apps or games or anything that also has a JavaScript-heavy page. You can download it now from mozilla.org slash Firefox slash beta. 
For a while now, the German government has considered making search engines either remove news excerpts from search results or pay for including them. With enforcement looking more likely later, uh, Google has launched a campaign called Defend Your Net, pointing out that its news service is ad-free, publishers can opt out, and claiming some German news organizations receive roughly half their traffic from Google searches. Remember that digital lock pick hack we saw at Black Hat? Mm. You know the one where folks could open your hotel room lock without needing a key? Yeah, hotels heard about that in the summer, right? Yeah, and they've taken care of it, except for the fact it's been exploited in the wild. A robbery at a Houston Hyatt looks like it was accomplished thanks to that hack. Now, last month, Houston officials arrested Matthew Cook for a similar crime. He's a suspect in the latest robbery. Yeah, I guess because he did it before. That makes him... Make did it, it again. Yeah. Uh, slight correction to the uh, to the Android market share story because I know someone's going to pick on this. It's iOS that has 48.1% of the market, not iPhone 5. It was thanks to the iPhone 5 bump. Thank because you. Because I know how that argument goes, which is like, well, Android has more phones. And it's just the iPhone. No, it's not the iPhone 5. It's the iOS. And iOS has three phones. So there. We've had that argument for you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's thank our sponsor for today's show, Pond5. Uh, the stock media marketplace, I know many of the folks in our audience are media makers of, them, of their own. They make films. You guys make podcasts. You make all kinds of great stuff, art. Uh, and that's why we want to tell you about stock media and Pond5. Using professional quality stock media from Pond5 is one of the best ways to extend your creativity and streamline your workflow. So you don't have to worry that somebody's going to come after you because of some image that you used without getting permission. Pond5 is a building block for creative resources. They have 10 million, and more than 10 million, professional quality and royalty-free. So once you pay for it, you get to use it. Photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphics templates, 3D models. They keep adding new categories and new things all the time. And part of the reason for that is because if you're actually an artist... You can shake up the traditional stock agency business with an open, artist-friendly marketplace for your professional content. Artists selling on the site, get, Pond5 gives you control over the pricing. Uh, and Plus, they pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. So you decide how much it's going to sell for, and you get half the cut. That's a higher payout than other stock photo marketplaces. So try it out as, as a media maker. Go take advantage of this special offer. This month, you can get 50 free stock media downloads by going to pond5.com slash TNT. That's P-O-N-D, the number 5.com slash TNT. Go there and put, put together something out of 50 free pieces. You can make an entire movie or something out of 50 free pieces of stock media. And let us know in the email, TNT at twit.tv. That's pond5.com slash TNT. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's start off by talking about the uh, the death of anonymity on the Google Play Review Store. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. Tim Stevens is joining us. I almost forgot. How, do, how could I possibly forget? Tim. How could you forgive me? I, well, please, you were, please you were being so me. quiet and patient. And polite. I, He's I just a nice guy. Right. But not to... in the chat room. I'm chatting up in there. But uh, yeah, <laughs> speaking wise, anyway, I'm keeping it quiet. <laughs> Tim Stevens, editor in chief in Engadget. I'm so sorry. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we'll, we, have, uh, we have some anonymity to talk about. Maybe anonymity was on my brain. I was trying to protect you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. I appreciate that. That's, you won't be protected anymore, Tim, when you start uh, leaving scathing app reviews in the Google Play Store, as I mentioned in the news views, starting now, so it, it actually doesn't, it won't apply to any review that you've already left, so it's not retroactive, but starting now, anytime you want to leave a review in the Google Play Store, which applies to, what, 700,000 apps that they have now uh, in the store for Android, you have to be linked to your Google Plus account. Now, Google Play says you don't want an account, you don't have to have one, but then you can't leave a review because we want to know who you are. We want to know the real person. You're going to have a photo linked to the account. Of course, the photo doesn't actually have to be of your face, but it's a photo that, that you choose, right? Everyone knows how, how Google Plus works. And the idea is to just cut down on, on the spam, on the comments from rival app developers who want an app to look worse than it is, or people who have some sort of a, a reason to to give less than helpful reviews in the App Store. Or even the company try to boost its own. By or that, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Now, in the Google Play Store, I'm not sure if it's as rampant as the issues that the Apple App Store has, but, I mean, it's a mess in there. I have wanted something like this uh, for Apple for a long time, especially when I mean, you see, you, you'll see five reviews, and it's like they're all five stars, and they're sort of weird account names. It's like, who are these people? How does, how does this actually help me? Because I don't know if I should trust them or not. Sometimes you can tell that they're fake, but sometimes you can't. Now, I think that not only should this apply to app stores, but... And Tim, I'm not sure what you guys use on Engadget. Do you use Livefire? 
for com- your comments. We do comments. use Livewire now, you know, which allows you to sign in through uh, a few different social accounts, Twitter, Facebook, that kind of thing. But it still has to be somehow associated with you, a real person, which cuts down on a bunch of junk, I would assume, that you would get in your comments otherwise. Yeah, it definitely does help on that front, and I think in general it's a good idea to have some kind of a tie back to a social network or something that's at least a little bit valuable to you so that you can't just go and sign up for a million different uh, accounts. So I think that should help things a bit here, but it's also going to help Google a lot too because they can really have a lot more metrics when it comes to tracking who's writing these reviews, what other reviews are they written, are they your friend, and then they can recommend apps that your friends like for you. So for them, this should be a pretty valuable thing. What do you guys think? I mean, is there a downside to this at all? I mean, I guess if you... If you don't like Google+, Plus, you don't like the idea of Google knowing that much more about your activity and the apps that you like and dislike, maybe there's a little concern here. But in general, I think this just levels the playing field. Well, you don't have to have a Google Plus account to download or Correct. buy an app. Yeah, you do still. that So there's, there's no, no worries there if you're like, wait a minute, I don't want to have to, you know, attach my Google Plus account to that. Uh, I do think that it might cut down more on critical reviews if you have to attach your name to it. You mm -hmm. might be a little less critical, which like, that's one of the good things, right, mm -hmm. is you don't have flame posts. You don't have people just unfairly smashing an app, whether it's uh, with nefarious purpose or not. But you also may not get, I don't know, you, there's an argument that you may not get as as honest of an opinion if you know your 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 name is there. But most of the time, I feel like, having real names attached to uh, to reviews does Im improve the comments. It improves the reviews. Yeah, and then there's also the concern that if you're a developer and you actually have a legitimate gripe with somebody else's app, and that's why you made your own, people will immediately go, oh, you're biased because you make this other thing. So I think there could be these leaps that could be, it could stop people from criticizing like you're saying, but on the developer side, because I know when I've seen a lot of apps in, this, in app stores and, and the Play Store, I'm like, this could be done better. I might write a review that might not, you, you could add this, that, the other thing. But if I make my own app, people will go, oh, you just criticize that because you have your own competing app. So I'm just kind of curious if that's going to cut from developers criticizing other developers when it comes to reviews. Well, it probably will, right? When it's obvious, that it's like, this is the worst app I've ever used. I have a very similar app <laughs> for the same price. Then it's like everyone can kind of roll their eyes and go, well, okay, mm -hmm. sure. And, of salt. and, and I, I suppose, you know, most developers are not going to be like this, but is it possible that some developer decides to start taking action against someone because they leave a bad review and they, and they, they, they start an online vendetta? Uh, again, I don't think that's a common thing, but it only takes one or two. A couple of people in the chat room have said, well, wait a second. Google Plus doesn't require you to use your real name anymore. You could sign up for multiple Google Plus accounts if you really wanted to. That's all true, but it still cuts down on, I mean, you... They do. They do require a, to be pretty a, calculated. To they do yeah, still require exactly. a real name in most cases. Sure. There, there are ways around it. Yeah. Though. So if you're I mean, really there, dedicated, there's a pseudonym. Yeah. I guess you could right. use, but it should actually get tracked back to a real person. I think it just in in general it cuts down on a lot of uh, a lot of junk. And the knee jerk reaction. That's that's one thing that I think is is good about this. Is um, you know you go into the Play Store and you look at a lot of reviews, and I'm sure it's the same on iOS potentially, but. Um, People will install an app and after three minutes, you know, not really give it the time of day, just open it up and be like, oh, it's too ugly for me. Close it, give it a one-star review and totally, you know, just just diss it entirely in the comments, uh, thereby influencing other people from giving it an actual honest try. Hopefully this kind of eliminates that a little bit too. Canada's getting something first. It's small. And it doesn't have an internet connection. Yeah. The, What's up with the, the Nintendo Wii Mini? <laughs> uh, that's that's a good question. I think that might be what we discuss about this. So we got the Wii Mini. It's been, uh, at, I think it's official at this point. $100 buys you a game console. No internet access. No online play. No streaming video. Also sounds like no virtual console. So what you're going to get is Wii games. Oh, yeah, no GameCube compatibility as well. So Nintendo's press release is also saying, oh, the $20 games with like Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Brothers. So the games are low cost and the console will be low cost. It's going to be available December 7th uh, in Canada, starting there. No information is available whether this is going to be out there in other territories. Meanwhile, the Wii U is, is selling in its first week. It sold 400,000 units in North America. The original Wii sold 600,000 in eight days. Uh, they both overlap with Black Friday. Nintendo's trying to move a whole bunch of the stuff by next uh, Q1 of 2013. You know, with, with the Wii Mini existing at all, is this $99 console like a gateway thing where like the Wii starts at... 99 bucks, and then you can get a internet capable one for 349. What do, what do you think, Tom? Uh, Tom, yeah. Okay. I'll I was go. gonna say Tim, but I said Tom. Uh, 
Uh, go, go ahead, Tim. Since I, I'm going to bounce. I will. Uh, since I forgot to introduce you, I'm going to, to cede my time to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll take the floor. Uh, it's an interesting move here, and the timing is very interesting as well. It seems like there were indications that they actually had meant to announce this last week. In fact, the press release was dated the 22nd, but it didn't come out until today. So it's a bit of a curious and kind of clumsy unveiling for the thing. And that's exclusive to Canada is, of course, very curious as well. The press release explicitly says... There'll be no information made until after the holidays about other availability. And, it, you know, it has to be available elsewhere in the world at some point. But it seems like at least until the end of the year, it's going to be exclusive in Canada. So that's curious, too. Um, but, you know, $100 only plays Wii games, um, probably won't have compatible with uh, GameCube controllers either. It's it's definitely a, a curious device. And honestly, you know, you can get a, a Wii for pretty cheap right now. The, the retail price is $150. You can use one for about 100 bucks and get the online connectivity and Netflix and GameCube compatibility. I think that's right now. That's the smart buy. Well, actually, I'll ask Tom a question because I'm going to actually, actually mean to ask you this time. Okay, this is obviously the in, this is the inverse of that rumored X top set top box, where like there would be this X, Xbox that would have all the internet stuff and none of the game. Well, casual gaming. Mm -hmm. Is there room for an actual just a throwback? game console like this is all it does well i get i get the feeling that nintendo is trying this out that's why they gave it to canada and only canada they they want to see what kind of uptake they get what kind of people buy this uh either to decide whether to roll it out more widely or, or to decide how to market it when they do i'm not certain that 99 dollars is the right price for it. I think there are plenty of people who don't care about internet connectivity in their game console. And, and Nintendo's been brilliant at marketing that side of the, the gaming universe, right? The casual gamers, the people who aren't in it, the people like, I just want a game console to play games. I don't care about browsing the web or Netflix or any of that stuff. And this could be perfect for that. Uh, I, I just, it, it feels like it should be a little cheaper. $99 seems like what a full-size Wii should sell for now, this far into its life cycle. So if you're taking away features, it should be $75 or $80. Yeah, some folks were, I was reading like commentary about this, and folks were like, well, Nintendo's online experience is awful anyway. What's the difference yeah, if it yeah, has yeah, it or I guess not? That's a good point. Friend codes and, and the limited selections, so 99 bucks. There you go. Um, Sarah, anything, any thoughts on the Wii Mini before we move on? I think it's weird that not only was it introduced to Canada alone, which is, you know, congratulations, Canada, but that there's no information about where it might potentially be available in the future. Mm -hmm. And I and I agree with you that it's probably, hey, this is a test market. This is where we're doing it. They've got their reasons. If it sells well, obviously it will be rolled out to other regions. But it's just kind of a, it, it is a, it's sort of, a, it's a curious release, especially yeah. at this time of year. It's very strange. We reached out to Nintendo to try to get any kind of indication about when or, or if it's coming to another uh, market. And, and of course, they wouldn't tell us anything at this point. It's, it's spelled right out in the PR that there's no information available. And I see there are people in chat asking if that's $99 U.S. or Canadian. That is $99 Canadian. But what you have to understand is that that's actually $101 in the United States because our currency is actually worth less than Canadian right now. So gone are the days when a $100 Canadian product was maybe $70 in the U.S., it's actually fair pricing at this point. Yeah, they're pretty... But yeah, pretty it is a bit too expensive, I think, too. Yeah. All right. Uh, bitter Struggle is uh, getting set up to be taking place in Dubai next week. The International Telecommunications Union... You may know them as the people who brought you the definition of 4G that everyone ignores. Uh, we'll be holding a conference December 3rd through December 14th. The main purpose of this conference is to update a treaty on how telecom companies interact across borders uh, to include the Internet. Now, that sounds like a, a perfectly reasonable thing to discuss, uh, but it's turning uh, out to be a showdown between developing countries, authoritarian regimes on one side, uh, and the United States and telecommunication companies. On, well, the telecommunications companies are actually on both sides. Uh, some countries are pushing to give the ITU, which, by the way, it's a UN arm now, but it's been around for 157 years, so it actually predates the UN. They want to give the ITU regulatory powers over the Internet, the way they were given regulatory powers over connecting telephone networks between different countries back in the day. Uh, for example, Russia wants broader permission to shape content and structure of the Internet within its borders. Now, every country can have its own Internet policy. Obviously, China has the Great Firewall. Uh, but there are certain things that the way the Internet is governed aren't easy to do if you want to control your own country's Internet. Uh, so you have to go the way Iran is going. And 
kind of recreate the internet if you want to have full control. Russia's like, well, we want to we want to change policy so we can have more control over the internet. Arab countries are pushing for universal identification. They don't want anybody to be able to be on the internet anonymously. They want a base, you know, IP addresses are not an identity. They want to change that. They want IP addresses to become an identity. Oh, that's uh, not a good idea. And some countries and telecom companies want content providers to pay for internet transmission. This is the old lie that somehow you can get content on the internet without paying, that it's a free ride over ISPs. They want to charge for the content to be delivered to their own customers. Content companies always pay in some way to get their content on the internet in the first place. Uh, on the other side of the issue, U.S. Congress and European Parliament have issued resolutions for a current decentralized system to remain so we've got a we've got some uh, a war of words shaping up. This is going to be a long conference. Most people are saying, ah, not much is going to happen. In fact, even the ITU's top official, Secretary General Hamadoun Touré, told Reuters that nothing will be adopted without near unanimity, that they won't just take a majority vote. Uh, and he believes only light touch regulation on cybersecurity will emerge by consensus. Uh, you got people like Vince Cerf saying that uh, these persistent attempts are just evidence that this breed of dinosaurs with their pea-sized brains hasn't figured out that they are dead yet because the signal hasn't traveled up their long necks. Yikes. Yeah. Okay. So on the one hand, you've got a reasonable, like, everything's going to be fine. On the other hand, you have some pretty angry people on both sides of this issue. Uh, Tim, what do you, do you think we'll end up just coming out of this conference at the other end with light touch regulation and nothing uh, new? Or, or is this anger going to boil over into a showdown? Yeah, I think it'll be light touch at the most. Uh, ultimately, you know, we hear a lot about this. We've heard a lot about this in the past as well. And ultimately, nothing has come of it. I think that we are, you know, in for at least another five or 10 years uh, of, of peaceful coexistence on the Internet where people try to do their own things. Like you mentioned, Iran and China trying to control things more than the U.S., of course. Uh, but any kind of attempts at doing anything sweeping like that and, and regulating a global identification system is going to take a lot more than they're going to be able to pull together at, at this event. So, no, I wouldn't be too worried. You know, I wouldn't worry about waking up the next morning and having an email that requires you to sign up and get your own global identifier said uh, I, don't, I don't think we'll see anything like that coming out of this event or anything in the near future in, in some ways though i almost wish we would uh i as and, and if we want to get like truly free internet that can route around all kinds of regulation you almost need a big scare like this google's leading the charge to try to start an anti-sopa uh sort of situation i kind of agree with tim though I'm, we're not going to see that but do you think we should well i mean we're, we're looking or we're focusing on a lot of the the very unpopular proposals it's supposed to be over 1300 so whether a, a u.n body is going to be able to create anything that does either something that we would consider positive or something that other countries would consider positive i it's just i just don't see this meeting creating anything it'd be interesting to see this okay we're going to actually formalize an open internet because that's how the system works now and it's worked really well so far. But for countries, and they have their interests, and, and I think when you put them all together and they've officially stated this stuff in one paragraph and you're seeing all the news, it looks horrifying. But this is the stuff that's been going on for years. So whether the, a UN body is going to help make a difference on this, I, I maybe I'm jaded on it. I just don't see, the, I don't see a UN body doing it. I could see it happening with private companies, but not the UN. Sarah, do you think IOS is right? Is this is this nothing to worry about because the UN's just too ineffectual or or could this be the you know the the creeping bit that if if they get even a little bit of progress toward regulation it could end up leading down the road, slippery slope sort of thing. Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of. I mean, in the worst case scenario, I I see okay, so the International Telecommunications Union starts talking about this stuff and everyone says, you know what, nothing's really going to happen. It's not really a big deal. We'd need, you know, a unanimous vote. And maybe because of that, not taking a hard line towards even the smallest of, well, progress for, uh, you know, depending on which country you are, it might be progress or, or, or something worse to somebody else. But you would take uh, uh, Arab countries, for example, saying, well, we want universal identification. They don't get enough attention about that. I think that's actually concerning, right? If we have an ineffectual organization who kind of goes, yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, you know, maybe that opens the door for something like that to happen down the road because they don't get enough pushback. Yeah. 
And in fact, it might be in the U.S.'s best interest to push for more decentralization and get get it away from the United States, because that's one of the big co controversies and one of the big criticisms is the U.S. still has too much control over the Internet. Right. Let's take a break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Squarespace. The new Squarespace now faster and easier than ever to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. They're great for photos now if you're like, yeah, I know, I want to do an online portfolio, but... You know, people have so many different devices. I, I don't know how to make a site that looks good on all the different screens. That's what Squarespace does with the new Squarespace 6. You actually get the ability to put a photo up and have it automatically resized, have the templates automatically adapt. So your site's going to look great no matter what screen somebody's on, whether they're on a phone, whether they're on a tablet, whether they're on a laptop or desktop. It's all going to work and you don't have to do any thinking about it. Squarespace takes it takes care of that. They take care of the underlying technologies, the HTML5, the CSS3, the JavaScript, the JSON. That's all done under the hood. So you get drag and drop functionality on every page you're editing. You it takes the barriers out of the way. You focus on the content and you get a great looking site. Plus it's reliable. Squarespace is always there to make sure your site is up and running try the beautiful templates try the drag and drop functionality try the social media integration look at the great designs all without risk you don't have to take our word for it go over there right now squarespace.com you don't have to have an offer code you don't have to have a special a credit card you don't have to give them anything you can just create a site anonymously uh and try it out if you do decide to keep the uh you'd have to give them an email address so i guess it's not entirely anonymous but if you do decide to keep the website uh Use this offer code. Here's where the offer code's worth it. TNT11 gets you 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts. And don't forget, if you sign up for a yearly account, you get that 10% off with TNT11 and you get a free domain name registration with your annual plan subscription. That's squarespace.com. Use the offer code TNT11. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Got some more... Uh, discussions to be had about e-commerce social networks don't help drive sales what well but i that, that's that's that, if you every social media expert tells me the opposite well, i know exactly it's sort of scary for them actually so we talked a little bit about uh, yesterday ibm had come out with a black friday report in in, in the, the recent weeks of the holiday season shopping and had some really promising stats for online and mobile commerce. A lot of people were flocking to the internet to buy apparel and goods more than ever. But there's some sort of interesting news. The same Black Friday report says that Twitter delivered 0% of all referral traffic and Facebook sent just 0.68% which is actually down from last year. IBM said that Twitter generated 0.02% of traffic last year, which is very low, but still higher than zero. Now, the, the TechCrunch article that sort of broke this apart said, listen, IBM did not disclose their methodology for this report, so we can't possibly know for sure that there isn't some sort of an error. Obviously, somebody is seeing something on Twitter and it, it leads to a purchase. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that Twitter does not have a really good way to get credited for what's known as downstream purchases. This is actually something that Facebook's working on right now. So for example, Facebook has introduced a, what they call self-serve user ID matching system and ads that drop cookies. So an advertiser might know if I bought something on their site that I had seen an ad for that on Facebook sometime in the recent past, you know, in the last week or month. So even if I don't click a direct link and purchase it, then the company knows there's a good chance that I might have seen it on Facebook first. It's not, a, it's not a guarantee, but it still factors into what that downstream purchase may have come from. But it's not really efficient, even on Facebook, because uh, downstream purchases, at least the way that Facebook has it set up right now, doesn't include something that Ayaz might have promoted on his page. Um, it doesn't include uh, word of mouth on Facebook. So if for some, uh, for example, the 25 most talked about pages uh, this week on Facebook, this is what Facebook uh, has announced. We're all like Walmart, Toys R Us, Macy's. Those had a lot of likes and comments and shares. And that's still not factoring into these downstream purchase numbers that an advertiser might get. So it's not an efficient model, but it's at least something that Facebook is working towards. Twitter doesn't even have anything like this at all. So if I, if somebody, if, if, if Best Buy uh, pays for a promoted tweet on Twitter and I click that promoted tweet and I go to a page and I buy something, well, that's one thing. 
But what if I see that promoted tweet and then I go about my day and 12 hours later, I'm like, oh yeah, I wanted to buy that, that HDMI cable, you know, for stocking stuffer for somebody. I just, I just type that into Google. That doesn't get counted as coming from Twitter at all, even though it is where I remembered I saw it first. But then Google gets the credit. So it's very interesting when we're going forward with a company like Twitter that really needs to make money and is really trying to convince businesses that, that not only should they be paying for promoted tweets on Twitter, but also having a real Twitter presence, having a social media team that is spreading the word about products uh, is worthwhile. What do you guys think? I mean, it's definitely hard to find metrics when it comes to mind share, effectively. What did you remember this? I mean, mm -hmm. if, I start, if I remember something on the side of a bus versus a billboard versus Twitter, it's, it's, it, this study almost makes it seem like, oh, it's not worthwhile to have social media. And that's obviously not the case because if, for some reason, it's stuck in your head, that was like the 80th time you saw that ad for that HDMI cable, and that's what put you over. It's very important, this, this for I guess, brand recognition, that it's out there. So it's just a really interesting... It's interesting to see the metrics that the, the, nobody's clicking on Twitter. I would assume people are just on web pages going to the deal sites and things. And maybe that's what they're doing. But maybe the behavior hasn't caught up yet. Just I've been complaining about this since I managed techtv.com back in 2001. It, it, they, because you can click doesn't mean that's the only value of advertising. Tim, you guys have got to deal with this over at Engadget, too, where... There's plenty of experience in television and print advertising for measuring the effect of advertising when there's no direct interaction, but nobody seems to want to apply it to the Internet. Yeah, absolutely. And it's getting even harder to track these people as we're having users come at us from, you know, Flipboard, from our apps, from our website, from RSS. It's very difficult for advertisers to get kind of a really good feel for what ads they're seeing and, you know, how they're consuming them or even if they're looking at them or if they're blocking them. And to, to look at this and to discount Twitter's impact, I think would be a, a bit short-sighted. I mean, if you look at, say, if somebody sees the, the tweet about our uh, Cyber Monday route, for example, they click on that tweet, they come to our page, and they click through that page to go buy something. Ultimately, it was Twitter then that, that uh, got them to, to see the product and to see the deal. But Twitter's getting no, you know, no visual, no tangible impact in that case. So, uh, you know, I, I think you have to look at Twitter as maybe second or third level influencer in this case of helping to find people or helping people to find products. And the same thing goes for Facebook. I mean, I don't know how many people were posting around Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals and retweeting Amazon's lightning deals over the past couple of days. And I know that a lot of people were buying things that way. So for it to show up as, you know, less than 1% seems a bit uh, a bit crazy to me. Yeah, and especially we had in the news views that yesterday was the biggest online shopping day ever. Mm -hmm. So something worked. Something, right. something got people uh, to do that. In fact, Amazon apparently set new records as well. Yeah, they sure know how to brag at Amazon without saying a whole lot. Uh, the company <laughs> says it broke its Black Friday records uh, for Kindle sales. It said the Kindle products are the top four spots of overall Amazon of, of sales in Amazon. Business Insider called it a uh, pretty much a informationless press release about the Kindle so uh, sales this morning. Of course, Amazon doesn't actually give any numbers on Kindle sales. That's why everyone's starting to complain about this. Amazon's not telling. Last year, uh, Jordan Rohan, uh, analyst, estimated Amazon sold around 6 million Kindles in quarter 4, 2011. Amazon said it sold 1 million, 1 million Kindle devices per week last December. Forrester has a guess. They said that Amazon sold 7 million Kindle fires. Okay, at what point do we need hard numbers or is the Amazon Kindle perceived as a success? Because we just don't know. I mean, I've seen them out in, in the wild, but I have never seen a hard number because Amazon just doesn't give that. What well, do we, so so there's, there's a good reason to not give out numbers. Ultimately, the company is kind of setting itself up for disappointment if indeed those numbers ever drop. So they can come out and say, hey, we sold 2 million Kindles this weekend. Everyone goes, wow, that's fantastic. And the stock goes through the roof and everybody's happy. But then what happens if next year they only sell 1.8 million Kindles for whatever reason? Uh, at that point, suddenly doom and gloom, the company's failing, the, the product line is over. Uh, and you see Apple kind of getting a little bit more vague about its numbers as we go forward. They kind of shift the dates a little bit. You know, what is the launch weekend? Is that expanding? The same thing for Nintendo. They've been a little bit cagey about the, the Wii U sales and trying to paint that against the Wii U successes in the past. So while you get a nice short-term boost from announcing these numbers and saying how successful you are right now, now you've set up this legacy that can kind of drag you down in the long term. So I imagine that's why Amazon isn't giving us numbers. And, and you know, since they've set this precedent, I don't know that they ever will, unfortunately. And a few people in the chat room are pointing out that Amazon values the profit they make off of selling you stuff, not selling you Kindles. They, they see Kindle as another vector to get your 
to get you to shop with them. And so what they that that makes sense to say the number we're using as our success metric is how much of our retail did we sell? How many digital downloads did we sell? Not how many actual Kindles did we sell in particular? I mean, I'm just curious about if there's no number, are we seeing it as a success? Because I know that we've seen, look, we've seen a lot of tablet out, a lot of tablet competitors to the iPad. And the Kindle Fire was the first like real major one with a, with a budget. Then the Fire HD came out, and that looks like a real winner when it comes to hardware. Is it because we don't have this information that we're just like? You mean oh, yeah. you think it's a lie that these that these estimates are, are not right? No, because you don't have any actual usually any actual sales information I'm for game consoles either. Does it help perception? I mean, we saw Nintendo's numbers, right? Mm -hmm. They were not as good as last year's. Do you think that as a tablet, it looks better because we don't have a number? Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if it looks like sales are falling, then people say, well, you sold more last year. I guess there's less interest, right? I mean, it, it if Amazon makes most of their money off of us buying things via the, these variety of hardware that Amazon sells us, then that's all Amazon really cares about. If they can work it out in the end, and that's where their, uh, their, their profit margins come from, then it makes a lot of sense for them to de-emphasize hardware sales. Yeah. All right, let's finish up with that Google ICOA uh, scandal yesterday. Uh, we, we mentioned it, uh, the story about Google allegedly purchasing ICOA for $400 million. Most likely turns out it was a pump and dump scheme. Uh, somebody trying to pump up the stock price for ICOA, sell it while the buzz was hot, and before people realized that it was a fake press release. ICOA CEO George Strothopoulos Strath told MIT Tech Review, easy for me to say, mm -hmm. uh, it came that the a press release at PR Web came from icoamail at gmail.com. And the phone number had an Aruba area code. Now, PR Web says that they uh, their process is designed to maintain the integrity of the releases we send out every day, even with reasonable safeguards. Identity theft occurs on occasion across all of the major wire services. That's very interesting. Danny Sullivan uh, did a, a take-apart piece on PR Web pointing out that you can pretty much get anything up on PR Web if you pay the fee. Uh, they they claim to distribute to places like Associated Press and the New York Times, uh, and in fact, uh, he uses a Viagra P press release that that looks pretty much like spam. The way it reads, "How to buy drugs, lowest price Viagra," uh, and he shows how it shows up on the Houston Chronicle. It shows up uh, in other uh, you know respectable sources because those sources are reprinting all of the PR web press releases. Uh, it does not look like Vocus, the company that owns PR web, does any vetting uh, of the situation. If you go to Business Wire or, or PR Newswire, you have to create an account. You have to create a password. Uh, you have to do some minimal things to show that you are a person. You don't have to do any of that stuff at PR web. Uh, Tim, uh, what does this say about the state of journalism that a company like this that doesn't really seem to have a lot of vetting in place is being reprinted automatically by highly respected news organizations out there? Uh, well, it says that we have some lessons t to learn. I mean, we, we got bit by this as well, and, and ultimately, the, you know, that was um, it was a mistake on our part to run the story. Uh, we saw that the next would pick it up, and we thought at that point that they had confirmation, so we ran with it. Ultimately, we should have gotten our own confirmation, and we did not. That was a mistake. Uh, so we need to be much more careful on our end about our sources f for these things, and ultimately, you know, we will never trust this source in particular going forward. And you know. I think the uh, the All Things Digital post that came a little bit later, they gave a little bit more explanation about what things were missing, made it pretty clear that this was something that ultimately we should have been pretty skeptical about in the first place. So, you know, there's such a huge rush to be first and to get the news online and to try to catch the tech meme. Uh, you know, those sorts of things really drive us to be very quick about these sorts of things, to post the story up and then follow up on it later. Um, but I think ultimately what we've learned is that we need to be a little bit more careful and indeed uh, we will be so. Uh, we will do so uh, going forward. Yeah, and we we almost got bit by it too. Uh, it's only accident of timing that mm -hmm. kept us from passing it along because Tech News Today operates uh, without a staff to go out and collect news stories. We don't we don't go out and be we're not reporters. We we rely on sites like Engadget uh, that we trust to say, okay, they, these guys, you know, Ars Technica, CNET, Engadget, The Verge, those guys are all doing a good job. So we're going to trust that what they're passing along is good. Uh, and and likewise. Uh, you guys did the same thing with the next web. You're like, well, we're gonna we we know the next web does good work, so you know we'll attribute it to them and we'll trust that it's good. And what happened is when you when you drilled down, it was turtles all the way down. When you got to yeah. the end, uh, it was PR web. And it sounds to me like people should not be trusting. 
PR web that they don't they don't have Wait, any what, yeah, where, kind of where system. Where does PR web yeah. go from here? I mean, PR Newswire, Business Businesswire have long histories of of uh, issuing press releases and, and bulk a allocating them. Uh, so so maybe those are more trustworthy. But even then, unless you get an actual press release directly from the company, uh, it it deserves a little more uh, attention uh, and a, and a little more vetting. Um, yeah, and even today, the press release about the uh, iMac release date came through on PR Newswire, and it came through about 15 minutes before it actually hit the Apple PR site. And at, at that point, you know, we we sat at it, and we looked yeah. at it, and we had, we, you know, we did a triple check to make sure that this was a legit press release before we ran the story because we didn't want to get caught in the same situation again. Of course, like you said, PR Newswire is a bit more reputable than this outlet has proven to be. But still, it was the same situation. It came through on the wire before it came through the official sources, and we had to be a little bit more careful this time. Yeah. All right, uh, real quickly, uh, Patrick Delahanty tipped us off in the uh, chat room. I has caught it that uh, Apple has fired their maps manager, at least according to a story on Bloomberg.com. Senior Vice President Eddie Q has let go Richard Williamson, who oversaw the mapping team. Now, the implication here is that uh, the maps, Apple Maps, has, has hurt uh, the company's uh, sales of the iPhone 5. That's what the headline says here. Uh, don't have a, a lot of time to, to spend analyzing this, but a... Uh, that a big surprise after the Scott Forstall uh, decision to to reorganize that Eddie Q would come in and start doing some evaluations and maybe some heads would roll. Looks like looks like one person has. Well, let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. I as you've had the story on CNN uh, about a gym. First of all, it's an outdoor gym in England. It looks like a playground, quite yeah. honestly. Uh, but it's playground it, for it, adults. Yeah. So if if you've ever wanted to work out for free, you could do that. But this gym, uh, as you pedal on a cycle or you move, I guess, an arm cycle or elliptical machine, it's going to take the energy you're using and it's going to store it there. And it's going to be able to uh, – the community right now has generated 40,000 watt hours. So you can use the energy of your exercise in your town if you use this gym. Right in now, what way? Like lamp, lamps? or I mean, Well, what? right now it's powering the lights on the actual park area. <laughs> but they hope... Work out so that you don't have to work out in the dark. <laughs> well, why not? Uh, but they, they hope incentive. that they'll, they'll be able to, to feed surplus energy yeah. back into the grid. Oh, that is awesome. Which is I love pretty it. great. What I don't get is why it has to be an outdoor gym. Like, I, 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 why can't they be this warmer? This is in Hull in northeast England. That can be a pretty darn cold place. Do you want to work out in the rain? I don't know. It's They're tougher people. There. You got to warm up, right? That's the thing. You're freezing outside. You got the little bicycle. You, you get warm that way, and you're giving energy back to your town. See, this is a better incentive than just Sarah burn off that muffin that you ate for breakfast. I kind of go like, eh, whatever. Power that street lamp. Well, yeah. Now. Do you want Ayaz to just sit there with a computer in the dark without electricity, or would you like him to work on the show? Let's get biking. It should give you carbon credits at the end of your workout. I love this. Yeah. This makes <laughs> so much more sense. Machines are like super industrial looking with diamond plate aluminum on all of them and you know everything just looks super durable like you could take a baseball bat and smack any of it and be fine of course you know it needs to survive the elements but yeah. presumably it needs to survive vandals too being sitting out there in the the wild it looks like you know some sort of alt future gym something from judge dread perhaps yeah it has to survive that harsh whole winter i guess and 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 the, you know when the soccer team loses you, never, you just never know. Well, maybe it can take all the kinetic impact and generate electricity with that. Too. That's a good idea. That's another thing. They like a, like a punching bag that takes it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I want to thank our last sponsor for today's show. This episode brought to you by Audible.com, the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles, all types of literature. They have fiction, nonfiction, periodicals, newspapers, and listeners of Tech News Today get a free audiobook to try it out. You will have a cleaner house. You'll exercise more. You'll drive farther. I don't know if the last one's a good thing or not, but the, those are the things I've found because I want to listen to I get a good book and I find excuses to keep listening to it uh, so go try a free audiobook right now go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT give Life of Pi a shot the, the movies in theaters right now you might go see the movie first and then then listen to the audiobook or vice versa you saw the movie uh, Sarah right I did I cried and cried it's a, it's a really good book though I've read the book there are there's a bridged and unabridged get the get the unabridged version it's not that much longer uh, and you can get it absolutely free by going to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT or, or any audiobook you want for free that's audiblepodcast.com slash TNT and we thank them for their support of tech news today
Shall we take a gander at the calendar? We shall. Uh, we got a conference this week. Venture Beats Cloud Beat Conference is happening tomorrow. Goes through Thursday in Redwood City, California. The Nintendo TV is launching on December 8th in Japan. It's just over a week from now. Uh, the U.S. and Europe will get it in 2013. Hey, we're not getting it in December now? No, we're uh, getting it in 2013, uh, which is not that far. Shame here, Nintendo. Just over a month You're away. You're going to like it, Tom. What is actually kind of far is the <laughs> Dive into Mobile Conference, uh, but they're already announcing it. It's going to happen in Manhattan on April 15th and 16th, 2013. That's the one that got canceled because of the hurricane. Right. So it's getting rescheduled all the way to April. Well, I guess they... Manhattan books up. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We've got an email from Yoav. He says, regarding yesterday's episode th uh, 635 about the Microsoft Xbox TV device, you were discussing whether it makes sense for Microsoft to introduce a weaker device to be sold in addition to the stronger new Xbox. I think it makes a lot of sense because of their play into a subscription model, which is permeating across the organization from Office 365 to personal Office subscriptions, and even their deal from the beginning of the year, including uh, getting the Xbox 360 for a monthly subscription fee. I can definitely see them pushing this as an Xbox Live subscription in which you get this new device for free and continuously pay for the content. To me, that falls in line with their new business model quite nicely. What do you think? Ah, okay. I, I, I think I want to have Sarah read the next email because it kind of bears on the answer to this. Vikas writes, I just bought an Xbox during the Thanksgiving Day deals primarily to use it as a Windows Media Center extender, but can't believe Microsoft wants me to buy, subscribe to the gold level of Xbox Live just to be able to use Netflix and Amazon Instant Video, even YouTube. I just have no words to describe how shocked I am. I already have three other devices, Sony Google TV, a Wii, a Panasonic TV that has Viera built in, can anyone explain what this bummer idea is? He spelled it Balmer, uh -huh. but I know what he meant. Vika's meet Yoav. Yeah. I think Yoav has the answer. <laughs> yeah, because that's brilliant. Because what the the theory is up till now is, well, you pay for Xbox Live because you want to play games online. Mm -hmm. You know, playing games online is the thing. So of course everybody's going to pay for the Xbox Gold subscription, and then they throw in the Netflixes and the Amazon Instant, all that stuff as extra perks to keep you interested in those periods where you're not playing online. Maybe you're between games or something. But there's people like you who are like, no, nah, if I'm going to buy an Xbox for the Entertainment Fest stuff, I'm not going to pay for the subscription to pay for a subscription. That doesn't make any sense. I have to pay for Netflix already. Well, maybe that's what Yoav's onto is they give away the box with a subscription that gives you Xbox Live Gold. So you get a free piece of hardware. It kind of flips it on its head. Yeah, wait, am I, are we crazy? Well, I mean, it's like moving towards that cell phone model that Xbox, Microsoft already tried. The question whether they'd give away for free, I don't know, maybe really cheap. But yeah. it, it's, it's, I think people pay the, the subscription fee for the online play. And without that, I think it's a really strange game. Tim, do you think they would do a subscription box? Again. They definitely could do something like that, but I don't think that they would do it for the low cost of free, unfortunately. I, I could see definitely something very cheap, but 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 not free. And something to complement, you know, whatever their high-power, high-octane gaming console is, but at a much lower cost. It would make sense to give access to all the online games that have been developed over the years and uh, to do it without having to need all the extra horsepower of, you know, Halo 5 and whatever else comes along after that. I, as and Tim, are being way too sensible. Sarah, help me out here. Microsoft should give it away free, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. What do they need exactly. all the money for? Free. Come on. Yeah, you have plenty cool. of money. Been making money for decades. Just give it free. All right. Uh, that is it uh, for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, go visit Engadget.com. Tim Stevens and crew are doing a great job over there. You guys got a holiday Thank gift you. guide up, I noticed. We do have a holiday gift guide up. We just launched our redesign, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. And we actually have a New York City and Gadget Reader meetup on Thursday night. So if you are in New York City and you don't mind braving the weather, come on out. It's going to be at Roseland Ballroom uh, starting at 6 p.m. It should be a good time. Tickets have, are available at the website. I have to say, I'm liking the redesign. It's pretty slick. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's good. We have a lot more tweaks to come. All right, check it out. Engadget.com. And if you're in New York, go go meet up. Say hi. Shake hands. You're going to be don't there. say hi right to me. Yeah, I nice. will be there. Absolutely. Excellent.
All right. Uh, thanks to everybody for submitting stories in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, the place to let us know what kinds of stories you'd like us to talk about on the show. That's technewstoday.reddit.com. And you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Give us, a, give us a little notion of your thoughts on the Xbox or anything else, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Aaron Newcomb from Floss Weekly. We'll see you then.